We are on the pathway to glory. We are on the pathway to glory. I hope that all of you, that you are joining me on the pathway to glory. Are you joining me today on the pathway to glory? And in order for, for us to follow Christ on the path to glory, something that we're going to take a look at here today is that our hearts, they must be in the right place. Our hearts, they must be right in the eyes of God for us to follow Christ on the path to glory. Now, we read responsibly today from the third chapter of Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, where we read from the seventh verse down through the 19th verse, that is again the third chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, from the seventh through the 19th verse, where in that passage of scripture, we saw both a word of encouragement and a word of warning about the heart of man. There in the 14th verse, if you happen to be looking at that passage of scripture, you'll see where the writer, we saw where the writer, he encouraged his people to become partakers in Christ. That's again, something that we was talking about in our Sunday school lesson here for today where one partakes in Christ means that they join in, that they are sharing in. In other words, that they are in fellowship with Christ, the writer desired for his people, the Jews, to, to be in fellowship with Christ. That goal is very clear here from the writer, where again, he desired for the people to, again, gain salvation, is what we saw there. Now, as we have seen in recent weeks, the people that the writer was writing to, they were neglecting God. They were neglecting salvation. That is the first steps walking down the opposite pathway of the path of glory, neglecting salvation. That's taking the first steps down the path to condemnation. Nobody should ever desire to, to go down the path to condemnation. Today, we see that there are many people who are suffering from what our writer focuses in on here in this scripture today, where many people's hearts are being beginning to harden in unbelief of salvation. We'll see there in my key verses for today, the 12th and the 13th verse. That is again, the 12th and the 13th verse. We'll see where the writer warned his people about hardening their hearts in unbelief of salvation. The writer said, beware, brethren, and said that lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He said there in the 13th verse, he said, exhort one another daily while it is called today. Do not wait lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. But again, there he said, beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, from both of those verses, I want to focus on, I want to talk about today for a thought. Do you have a heart problem? Again, my thought for today is, do you have a heart problem? problem. Now, the writer there, as we take a look at those key verses there, the writer was warning about lacking faith in the word of God. Lacking faith in the word of God, lacking faith in his promise, the promise of salvation. And so that makes one wonder. It makes me ask the question today, can one be in, can one not be in fellowship with Christ and somehow make it to heaven? Can one be in fellowship with Christ, but doubt him in their hearts today? Doubt is something that, that again, we have to take a look at today. Doubting the Lord, doubting his salvation. That's something that we have to address today especially if we're trying to follow Christ 
on the pathway to glory. Now, I already said, no, uh uh-uh, Auntie Frown got a big frown on on her face right now. Brett Harry got the same frown on his face as well. So y'all already riding with me on this one. But we have to focus on doubt today because whether you realize it or not, many of us, we have doubt in our heart today. And we say that we are following Christ on the pathway to glory. So again, the the problem that the writer faced is still a, a very present problem that we face in the world today where people are doubting God, where people are doubting his promise. People doubt that he will come again. People doubt that he will return again to receive us unto himself. They mock, they scoff, they say, hey, he hasn't returned yet. There are many people today that doubt the Lord. Not only do people doubt the Lord, not only do people doubt his promise, not only do people doubt they neglect his salvation, many people are starting to grow hardened in their hearts today out of not believing in it. Many people are hardening their hearts in doubting God. Many people are hardening their hearts in unbelief of the promise of salvation today. This is a problem that is outside of the church, but there are many people that come through the church doors today that sit in the pews or the chairs of the church, and they have doubt in their hearts today about what God can do for them and what God will do for them. Now, the hardened heart, we must understand today, that is the heart that cannot be persuaded. That is the heart that cannot be moved. In other words, that is the heart that is stubborn, if you will. It would be good if one's heart was stubborn towards moving in sin. It would be good if one's heart was stubborn to the ways of the devil. But it is a terrible thing today for one's heart to be stubborn to God, to his word, and to his promise of salvation. You see, something that I want you to understand today is that doubt is the enemy of faith. We're in the third chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. I say that doubt is the enemy of faith because where faith desires to push forward, guess what doubt desires to do? Doubt desires to sit down. Doubt desires to turn around and to go back the other way. Doubt, it does not want to move forward where faith says to us today, keep on going. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult things get, faith says to us today, keep pushing forward. Now, there is a great illustration between faith and doubt that is recorded in the 14th chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 28th through the 31st verse, where in that passage of scripture, we see where Peter, he desired to walk on water with Jesus. Jesus, he was coming to the disciples on on the water. Peter looked out there, said, hey, command me to come off the ship and come out here, come out there to you, Jesus. The scripture shows us in that passage of scripture that for a brief moment, Peter, he did walk on the water. He stepped out on the water. He walked on the water. So long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, everything was okay. But then Peter, he took his eyes off Jesus. Scripture tells us there that he noticed the the boisterous, the powerful wind. And when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to fear the wind. And we're told in that scripture that he began to fall in the water. And if it was not for Jesus reaching out and catching him, Peter, he would have been lost. 
And Jesus, he said to him there in that scripture in the 31st verse, 14th chapter of Matthew's gospel, he said to Peter, oh, you of little faith. And then he asked, why did you doubt? Again, the difference between faith and doubt. You see, I want you to understand today that if you allow doubt to rest in your soul, if you allow doubt to rest in your heart, it will sink you. Over in the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 16th through the 21st verse, we see an, another occasion where the disciples, there was a, a boy that had demons. He was possessed with a demon and it, the child was brought to the disciples and they had an occasion to where they could have cast the demon out of the boy, but they was unable to do so. When Jesus, James, John, and Peter, when they came out of the mountain after the transfiguration, the man brought his son to Jesus and Jesus cast the demon out of the boy and the disciples, they asked Jesus, they, they asked Jesus, why couldn't we do it? Why, why weren't we able to cast out the demon? And we'll see there in that scripture, there in the 20th verse, that Jesus, he said to the disciples, because of your unbelief, so because of their doubt, Jesus answered there. He said, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And Jesus said, it will move. And then Jesus, he said to the disciples there, nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing is impossible for all of us who again walk by faith in Christ, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson here for today. Again, Jesus, I want you to understand, he made it very clear to us today. Nothing is impossible so long as you believe, so long as you have faith in him. Do not doubt the Lord. Paul, he said to the Philippians in the old, very familiar saying there, Paul, he said, I can do all things through who? Oh, somebody know that verse, huh? He said, I can do all things through Christ who does what? Oh, I guess somebody really know that verse, huh? So I say to you today, when you are on the path to glory, you cannot let doubt enter into your heart because if you let it enter into your heart just for a moment, as it did with Peter, you will sink. And so if you cannot let doubt enter into your heart for just a moment, you should not let doubt make a home in you. Do you hear me here today? You cannot let doubt make a home in you because Christ on the pathway to glory, Christ desires to keep pushing forward. Whereas doubt, when you doubt Christ, you're going to start saying, no, I don't want to keep going that way. And you're going to start hitting the moonwalk and you're going to just keep going backwards. Again, the path that we are on, it's not a broad path. It is a narrow path. That's what I said in the first sermon in this series, right? And I said that on this narrow path, we are going to have obstacles that fall down before us. There are going to be branches and everything in the pathway trying to block us, trying to hold us back. And I liken those things to sin. Sin surrounds us. Darkness surrounds us on this journey. And so many of us, we will have moments on this journey where we become frightful in our heart to where we will fear. Fear will give way to doubt if we allow it. 
and that doubt, it will hold us back. Again, I ask you today, do you think that you can follow Christ on the path to glory with doubt in your heart? Now, as we take a look back at the third chapter of Hebrews, we'll see that the writer referenced a rebellion there, referenced the trial in the wilderness. We take a look at the eighth verse there. And the writer will see desire to again show his people, the Jews, the danger of doubt being in the heart. Now, the rebellion, the day of trial that's in the wilderness that's mentioned there in the scripture, we should understand that that is a reference to the time when the children of Israel was camping in the wilderness of Paran one of the most pivotal occasions that we find in scripture is when the children of Israel were camping in the wilderness of Paran. Somebody may begin to wonder, well, what happened in the wilderness of Paran? If we turn over to the first chapter of Deuteronomy, let's turn over there. Join me turning over there. We can see what happens. What happened in the wilderness of Paran, that's actually recorded in two places in, in scripture in both the 13th and the 14th chapter of Numbers, and over here in the first chapter of Deuteronomy. When you get over to the first chapter in Deuteronomy, you can take a look at scripture. We're gonna take a look at scripture that runs from the 19th all the way through the 46th verse. I'm not gonna read every single verse. You don't have to start thinking to yourself, oh man, it's gonna be a long one today. But we are gonna tackle some verses here in this scripture. We'll see there in the 19th verse that after they left Mount Sinai, the children of Israel, they again, they arrived in the wilderness of Paran. They arrived specifically to Kadesh Barnea. We're told they're in, in that 19th verse. Even more importantly there in the 21st verse, we'll see that the scripture tells us that it was at this point on their journey that the promised land was now set before them. They could see the promised land. Now, let me give you some background information on this. The children of Israel, after they left Egypt, after they crossed the Red Sea, they arrived at Mount Sinai and they stayed at Mount Sinai for over a year. And so when they arrived to Kadesh Barnea, it was two years after they had been freed from the bondage of Egypt. Two years. Now, a lot of times we think of the 40 years in the wilderness, right? But after two years, the children of Israel, they could have entered into the promised land. We'll see that in the scripture. All they had to do was to possess the land but something present, prevented them, something prevented them from being able to go in and to possess the land because they shown up didn't do it in two years. Again, we always think of them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, don't we? So what was it that held them up? Now over in the 13th chapter is numbers and the second verse, you don't have to turn there. We, we, get, we often get the impression that God commanded Moses to send the spies over into the land of Canaan, right? We always think that it was God that, that commanded Moses to send the spies over into the promised land. Yet one would have to wonder, with God being God, why would he need for somebody to send spies over into a land to spy it out? He is God, right? He created all of this. He, he is all-knowing. He is omniscient, right? He is omnipresent, meaning that he's everywhere at all times, right? So surely, with him being God, he would know what's going on in the promised land. Surely, with him being God, he wouldn't need anybody to scout, to spy out the land. So when we look at that 22nd verse there in the first chapter of Deuteronomy, 
We'll see who it was that was behind the spies being sent over into the promised land. That scripture, it makes it very clear that it was the people. The people, they, they came to Moses and they desired to send spies into the land to, to scout out the land, to spy the land, to see the people that, that was in the land. To, to get those spies to bring back a report about the land, about the people that was in the land, and about the cities that was in the land. It seems to me that the people, seems that they had a little bit of, of trepidation, if you will, about going over into the promised land. Seems that they had a, a bit of fear about going over into the promised land when God had commanded them Hey, just go over into the land and possess it. Seems like the people were saying, you know, Moses, it would be smart of us to send some folks over into the land to spy out the land. You know, they were big brain in it, wasn't it? And, you know, many of us, we would think, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, they're going over into to a land that they don't know. They're going over into a foreign land, right? And so, you know, we would think, hey, it makes sense for them to send a few spies over into the land. And for those spies to, to come back and, and to give a report on the land. Again, we would say, hey, that makes a lot of sense. But I, I say to you today that when it comes to the Lord, when it comes to walking by faith, we must learn to commit ourselves to following the Lord. Do you, do you understand what I mean by that? You see, while that land may have been a foreign land, God, he knew that land. In fact, the Lord had sent Abraham over into that land. Abraham, when you take a look at him in scripture, he didn't have nobody, no spies go into the land and bring back a report to him. Abraham, when he was commanded by the Lord to go inherit that land, Abraham said, okay, I'm going to go. And that's what he did. But here the children of Israel were questioning the land, questioning what was ahead of them. And, and it makes me wonder whether or not they were truly walking by faith. Uh, I must ask today, when the Lord directs your steps, you know how we talk about the Lord, how he orders our steps. You know how we love to sing the song. When he directs your path, do you question him? Do you delay? Do you hesitate? Now, of course, there will be times where we are going to do it. I saw some shaking heads. Y'all ain't perfect out there. I know it. There are times where we are going to be a bit hesitant. We're going to wonder, what is God doing? Why is God sending me this way? Why is he sending me that way? But again, we must learn to, again, commit ourselves to following him without questioning it, without hesitating it. David, he said in the 37th Psalm, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it the way he shall bring it to pass. One of the biggest problems that, that many of us face today is that we let our fear give way to doubt. Fear and doubt, I want you to understand, they aren't the same thing. You see, at times, fear can be a very good motivator for us to, to, to improve, to get better. Somebody's going to look at me kind of strange when I say that. But again, you know, many of us, we, we fear having poor health. And out of that fear, guess what we do? We do our best to, to stay in good health. You know, we, we, we may not have the best diet in the world, but we try to have somewhat kind of a healthy diet, right? You know, we, we know when something ain't good for us to eat, and we'll say, I better not have that today. Some of us, we exercise, right? You know, I fear God's punishment of sin. I fear how God would judge me. And so because I fear how God would judge me, guess what I do? 
I do my best to follow him. I, I do my best to live according to his way, his instructions, his word. Because I believe, according again to, to Christ, if I do this, I will please the Lord. I will find favor in his eyes and I, not, I will not be cast away into that eternal condemnation. So again, we must learn how to, to commit our way to the Lord. We must learn how, how to trust him. We must learn not to doubt the Lord. This is something, when I think about doubting God, it's something that reminds me of something that my dad used to say all of the time when it came to, to the Lord. He would always say that, now, when God, when he lays something on you, when he puts something into your heart, when you realize that God is moving for you and God tells you to move, my dad would always say, do not delay. He would always say, move, put it in motion. Don't question it. Keep on going. His thoughts behind it was that when we doubt, when we delay, when we hesitate, it will never get done. That's what he will always say. When you doubt, it will never get done and you will end up missing out on the blessing that God has for you. That is the biggest problem that many of us we face today is that Christ is ordering our steps. He is directing our path, but we are doubting him. And then we end up missing out on the blessing that God has for us because we let our doubt block us. We always say that the devil is our enemy. The devil is the one that's blocking us from our blessing. No, I tell you today that you are your own worst enemy. Your doubt is your own worst enemy. And something that we are going to see here in a moment is that your doubt, it will block you from entering into God's rest. And we'll see there in our scripture that God, he permitted the children of Israel to send in their spies. Again, when they sent in their spies, it delayed them from entering into the promised land more ways than they realized. There in the 25th verse, when the spies, when they returned back from, from spying the land, we are told there that the spies, that they all agreed that the land was a good land. Now again, because we know the story very well, we know that over in the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers, we know that 10 of the spies, after saying that, they, they began to speak against going in and possessing the land. They began to speak against God's blessing. They began to speak against entering into God's rest. Imagine speaking against entering into God's rest. Over in the book of Numbers, in the 28th verse of the 13th chapter, we see in that scripture that fear, the fear of the spies, it again, it turned into doubt. It turned into what Israel would not be able to do in the promised land. Those spies, they gave a report that the people that dwelt in the land, they were strong. The cities that was in that land, they were large and they were fortified. And then those spies, they also reported, hey, we've seen the sons of Anakim in that land as well. Those were giants. And so the spies, 10 of them anyway, they doubted that Israel would be able to overcome the strong people. They doubted that Israel would be able to overcome those large and those fortified cities. They doubted that Israel would be able to overcome those giants that lived in the land. And again, if those things weren't enough 
that they believed Israel could not overcome. They pointed out, hey, our adversaries, our enemies, they dwell in that land as well. They mentioned the Amalekites, but oddly enough, Israel, they had already defeated the Amalekites at one point on their journey before even reaching the promised land. They had already shown that they could overcome their adversaries, but here the spies were saying, no, we can't overcome them. They were doubting Israel. They were doubting their capabilities. But more importantly, I want you to understand that they were doubting the one that was leading them. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not talking about Moses. You see, their true leader was the Lord who led them by day by what? How many of us know that one? Pillar of cloud by day, and then by night it was a pillar of fire. It was God that, that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And here the spies were essentially saying, God can't lead us there. This report, it discouraged the people. As we take a look at the 27th verse there, We'll see that the people, they began to complain in their tents that God hated them. Look at what doubt was doing there. Doubt had the people questioning whether or not the Lord loved them or did he hate them. And then doubt had them settle on God hates us. We'll even see there that doubt, as it began to settle in their hearts, that the people, they began to believe that God had it out for them. They began to believe that God was bringing them to a land to be destroyed. Look at what doubt was doing here to the people. How many of us have ever had a moment where we doubted that God wanted what was best for us. You know, many of us, we, we have moments where we begin to question why God leading me, why, why God hasn't did this for me? Why God leading me this way? Why haven't I gotten this? Why haven't I gotten that? Why does God not love me? Oh, we don't had those questions before. We don't said those things before. There are many that began to believe that God don't want them to succeed. When God has always said that he desires for us to be blessed, that he desires to bless us. Where again, his desire for us is a future and a hope for us. Many of us, when we begin to think that God has it out for us, we begin to think about the past when when things were so good for us. And when we start thinking that way, rather than pushing forward on the journey down the path to glory, guess what many of us do? Because we just started to doubt. We started to go backwards. And that's what the children of Israel, that's what they desired to do. Hey, let us, let us not enter into to God's rest, the blessing, the promised land. Let's go back to Egypt, they said. We see there in the 28th verse that the people, they began to buy into that doubt that was sown by the 10 spies there. They began to believe that they, they could not overcome those strong people. They believed that they could not overcome the cities that they said were fortified up to heaven. Imagine that. If you skip down to the 32nd verse, you'll see that even when Moses, and again, we know that, that Caleb and Joshua, that they was trying to encourage the people as well to stop thinking that way. When they encouraged the people to trust God, when they encouraged the people that God would go before them and that God will fight for them on their behalf, doubt had hardened in their heart and, and the people they doubted the Lord. They doubted what God could do for them. Let me tell you something today. 
if you're on the path to glory with me and you have this kind of doubt in your heart, you are going nowhere fast. You cannot follow Christ down that dark, narrow path with that kind of doubt in your heart. You will not gain salvation. You will not be saved. You will not enter into God's rest. I hope you hear me here today. Now, let us pay close attention there to the 34th verse to to how the Lord responded to hearing the doubt of the people. We're told there in that verse that the Lord, he wasn't happy. He wasn't smiling. We're told there that God was angry and that he made an oath, a promise. You see, God, he had been dealing with this kind of, of, of heart from the people already before where they couldn't even wait for Moses to come out of the mountain, out of Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. They had to make themselves a calf of gold and worship around a calf of gold. And like I said last week, there are many people today who cannot wait for Christ to come back. They have built themselves up a calf of gold. And they worship around the calf of gold today, bowing down to the calf of gold. That calf of gold is their Lord and Savior today. And they put all their faith, they put all their trust in that calf of gold. And that calf of gold ain't nothing but a whole bunch of wickedness that'll lead them nowhere but to their death and to their destruction. Be careful about following that, path, that calf of gold today. So God, he made an oath there in the 35th verse. He said that not one of those of that evil generation, he said not one of them would see the good land that he had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now God, he don't have to make oaths. So when God, when he makes an oath, when he makes a promise, it's serious business. He mean it. He ain't playing around when he makes an oath, when he makes a promise. That's why we should take salvation very seriously today. Because again, he made a promise and he made that promise on his only begotten son and his shed blood. That's why we shouldn't, that's why we shouldn't make light of salvation here. So the only ones we're told there in scripture, 36 through 39 verse there, the only ones that would be able to inherit that land was the two that were of faith. That's Joshua and Caleb. And then the children of the evil generation. Now let's not overlook the fact there in that 35th verse that God, when he looked at that generation, that when he looked at those who had that heart of doubt, he looked at them as evil, as wicked, as, in other words, sinners, the disobedient. Now, no doubt is, is part of our nature. Though we're going to have those moments of doubt again, I encourage you, I urge you today, overcome your doubt. Don't let it rest in you. Don't let doubt be who you are. Because again, God does not look kindly on those who have a heart of doubt. Those who have a heart of doubt, their heart is not well. And God, he looks at those that have that heart of doubt as being of an evil generation. So we'll see there that God, he turned the evil generation, he turned them away from the promised land. He turned them away because they doubted him. They doubted what he could do when he had already shown him what he was able to do. God has shown us today what he's able to do. Now, many don't recognize it because their hearts are unable to perceive it. But again, I know what God has done for me. I know what God has brought me through. 
And so, so many will look at me and say, oh, you believe in that invisible God. You give that invisible God all of your time. What? He hasn't come back yet. It's so meaningless. It's so pointless of you doing that. But again, I know what God has done for me. And I am confident in my faith in him. And such confidence, it will be rewarded. But what about doubt? I wonder how many of us today are being turned away from his rest, his promise, his promise of everlasting life because we doubt him. Because we doubt his word, we doubt what he is able to do and what he will do. I wonder how many of us today God is angry and upset with and looking at as an evil generation and he is turning away today. So that evil generation, we are told there in the 40th verse, we are told that they were made to take their journey out into the wilderness rather than into the promised land. And again, we know that they wandered in that wilderness for 40 years to where they passed away. They died because of their doubt. Their doubt led to death. Their doubt, it prevented them from being able to enter into the promised land. It prevented them from being able to enter into God's rest. Now, oddly enough, after realizing the seriousness of their error, we'll see there in the scripture that the people, they tried to make things right with God. There in the 41st verse, they determined within themselves that, hey, you know, God, he commanded us to fight. We want the promised land. Now, let's go and fight. But you see, the problem with this is that it was too little too late. God had already made up his mind. He made an oath. There in the 42nd verse, we'll even see that God, he forbid them from trying to go up and fight. He said, lest you die. Don't go up and be fighting on my, my behalf. It's too late. But this, this generation, they were hard-headed. They went up and they did it anyway. And we'll, we'll see that in the 43rd and the 44th verse, that, that in their ignoring of the Lord, that they were beaten. They were defeated. They ran away. And all they could do was weep. And there in the, fifth, the 45th verse, we see something that is incredibly sad. So see, in all of their weeping, we'll see that the Lord, he didn't listen to them. God, he ignored their weeping. He did not listen to their weeping, all because they disregarded him. All because they neglected him his promise, his salvation, his rest. God said, you can cry all you want. I'm not listening. Could you imagine God saying that to you today? Would you want God saying that to you today? All because you have doubt in your heart. So this trial that was in the wilderness, it, it turns into an illustration and it turned into an illustration for generations to come about having that doubt in your heart, having that heart of, of unbelief. And the writer, again, there in my key verse today, he warned about having that evil heart of unbelief. There's that word again, evil. You see, unbelief in, in that wilderness was the great sin of the children of Israel, that generation. Doubting that they could enter into the promised land, that they could possess the promised land, it caused the people to turn away from God's blessing. God sent them away. They departed from the Lord. Look at what doubt causes. It causes one to depart from the Lord. We are on the path to glory today. Y'all said y'all joining me on the path to glory. It is a path that takes us to the promised land, not the land in Canaan, not that land that's being fought over today. I don't want anything to do with that land that's being fought over today. I don't care for it. 
Look at the land. It's a desolate land. I want the land that is rich in eternal life, that is rich in everlasting riches. I want to go to that land that has been promised to me. Christ, he said in the 14th chapter of Judge's Gospel, that as it is recorded, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I am going to come again and receive you who are of sincere faith unto myself so that where I am, you will be also. Do you desire to be there today? In order to get to that land, we must follow Christ. We don't know the way there. That land, it is a foreign land to us. The pathway to that land is foreign to us as well. So we must follow Christ. And again, I say to you today, you cannot doubt where Christ is going to take you on this journey if you desire to reach that land. So the question that we need to answer now is how do we overcome doubt in following Christ? If there is doubt in, in our hearts today, how do we overcome that doubt? Because we don't want to be wilderness Christians. There are enough wilderness Christians living in the world today. Those who love to profess that they believe. We don't want to be wilderness Christians because we know that in the wilderness, there ain't nothing but death. And that's not what we want, is it? So how do we overcome the doubt? Well, to follow Christ and to enter into his rest, we must pay him close attention, right? You know, if you're following someone and you aren't paying them any attention, you get distracted, you may lose track of them. And that's the quickest way to, to get it lost. We don't want to be lost on a foreign pathway to a foreign land, do we? So first off, to overcome our doubt, we need to keep our eyes on Christ. We don't want a repeat of Peter. We must keep all of our attention on him and him alone. Then from his own personal experience, Peter said over in first Peter, the fifth chapter and the sixth verse, Peter said that we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Peter said to humble ourselves in this manner, we must learn to let go and let God. Now, what do I mean by that? We must learn to let go of our doubt of the Lord and let God have the will. You see, we again, we must understand our place in all of this. We are not the leaders. Christ is the leader. How can we go to a place where we don't know the way to the place? So again, we, we, we must pay attention. Again, we must be humble. And then we must live for Christ. As Paul said to the Philippians, to live is Christ. Christ, again, must be, as I said last week, he must be at the head. He must truly be the head of our life. You see, when we let go and we let God direct our path, I assure you today that you will make it down the dark and the narrow path. And that dark, as I said in the first sermon in this series, that dark and that narrow path, it will open up to life. And you will be able to enter into the rest of God. On this path to glory, we must be disciplined in our walk so that we are not led astray. So that again, if we are disciplined, we know, again, we are assured that we will go down that narrow path with Christ. That path again, it is going to open up. There will be life and there will be rest there. We again, we must trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean on the Lord, not ourselves, not our own understanding. 
And again, when we do this, we are able to overcome doubt. Doubt will not sink us. We will be moving forward in faith and our faith will be rewarded when we enter into the gates of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. 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 Hey there, thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's sermon. I hope again that you took something out of this week's sermon that you can apply it to yourself and that you can walk in it, that you can live by faith. Make sure that you share this week's message. Make sure you're sharing it with someone somewhere. And again, I hope that you'll come back for next week's sermon. Make sure that you're following the channel so that you don't miss the next notification for next week's sermon so that you don't miss a notification for the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies or the food for thoughts as well. Make sure that you're following the channel today.